Hey legends, and welcome to Unbeatable You, where we connect, thrive, and conquer. I'm your host, Brett Robbo, and I'm super grateful for your valuable time. So let's just dive straight in. Keep thriving and enjoy. Fifth, fifth time better. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I've never actually met a fighter pilot before. You're definitely the Who first Who are the other one. ones? Have you had Maddie? Did- no, you're, you're definitely the first one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic so boo it's gonna say it's like uh like butts everyone's got one yeah <laughs> yes i'm guilty of that and uh boo you are a former fighter pilot you're the author of the book uh on time on target and you're the front man of the performance coaching company called afterburner you've also got some very interesting stories of starting and running businesses in afghanistan that i'm Really intrigued to hear a lot more about in this chat. You're a man of much wisdom from much experience. Welcome to the Unbeatable You podcast, my man. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it, mate. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I could class myself as being full of wisdom. I think everyone uh, is in pursuit of it, but uh, it's elusive uh, in in itself. Wisdom. I think once you think you once you perceive yourself as being wise, you've probably just become. Most is it okay if I perceive uh, you to be you wise? Thank you for that kind introduction, mate. You can perceive everything that is life. Life is perception. There is no reality. As um, I've just been reading in Neil Seth's new book, "Being You," there is no such thing as reality. Life is purely a controlled hallucination, mm. uh, given the uh, the way the brain works, and that it's just a whole bunch of electric signals, really. Uh, and anything anything that is one microsecond ahead of now does not exist. Just the perception of it exists. So, mate, you can perceive me as being wise or, or anything else that you like. Perception is the world that we... Uh, oh, that we mate, have. I love that. I love hearing that, you know, this is where your, your head's at at the moment and that kind of stuff. I, I say to people that where you are right now and where you want to be, the gap between, like, it's a clean slate. And I mean, not just like next week, next year, it's the, the every minute of every moment. And what creates that reality is is your presence and the choices that you make now. It's not the past experiences. Yes, we'll take them with us as memories. However, it's that clean slate as we move forward. So, mate, this is probably um, in alignment with why you became a fighter pilot for your uh, your desire to learn more and understand more about how things work at a deeper level. And I'd love to hear about it. How did you actually get into and want to become a fighter pilot? Was it the Top Gun movie or was there something else beneath that before before Top Gun was a reality, uh, yeah. Look, I wish it was a commitment to learning and wanting to learn more, but I demonstrated throughout my school a, a, a deep lack of interest in learning <laughs> and, and study and being being an academically um, very very poor. Which, as I found out only just a year ago, that was probably more to do with um, an undiagnosed ADHD than uh, anything else. Uh, uh, did after did uh, Top Gun have a role to play? Uh, probably in the same way, putting Mentos into a Coke bottle. Yeah, it probably accelerated <laughs> things a little bit. But uh, wanting to be a fighter pilot was uh, very much uh, in my DNA from the start. And I think the the whole the uh, vision of being a fighter pilot started at my very first air show uh, when I was was quite impressionable, uh, and I was only about four or five years old, can't remember exactly. Uh, and uh, I lived up in Queensland in Australia, beautiful part of the world. They used to have an air show every year up there. And I remember just sitting the, on the grass uh, in the days back in the 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, where there wasn't really much in the way of rules or fences or anything. So it was quite an immersive environment. And I remember just watching these fighter jets just taxi past. They felt like they were, they were in, in arm's reach. And as they went past, you, I would look at the, the sun sort of glistening off the canopies and the visors and the, and the, and the fighter pilots, which kind of looked just like Star Wars, which was kind of de rigueur in terms of you know, young boy movies at the time. And, and when I watched these aircraft go past, I was just sort of thought, man, this is, in, this is incredible. They're all clean and shiny and the waft of hot jet fuel on a beautiful summer's day washed over. And then when they went flying, it was just you know another level. And, and interestingly for me, I, whilst I love the fighter jets and I love the noise of, of them flying past, I just loved everything that was flying, it, no matter what it was. I thought everything was absolutely brilliant. And then walking around the air show and 
meeting the fighter pilots and buying the patches. I just thought the whole thing was just this enormous adventure. And I just felt this visceral connection with what was going on. And probably one of the most compelling moments was uh, when I was watching the air show and, and a fighter jet came from behind the crowd line uh, and I and the shadow just washed over me. And I looked up and I saw this fighter jet and I'm like, how come I can see that fighter jet? And I can't hear anything. And midway through that thought, just this an enormous roar and shockwave came over me uh, as this uh, you know, fighter jet just came over just below the speed of sound. Uh, and I just burst into tears. And at that moment, I think having this uh, these diametrically opposed feelings simultaneously, one being fear uh, and the other being ecstasy and joy uh, and I think it just created this neural explosion inside my brain and my heart that connected me uh, with the identity of being a fighter pilot. And that's pretty much what I carried from that day forward until I became one, uh, you know, 17 years later uh, when I started flying fighter jets. Uh, so for me, it wasn't thinking about being a fighter pilot. I was, I was just going to be one. There, there was no doubt about it uh, from, from that moment on. And, and fortunately, that I was connected with that sense of purpose because I did find learning a struggle. Uh, I did find academics and still find academics quite uh, difficult, well, quite boring. Uh, and I, I think that that sense of purpose and that incredibly bright North Star uh, allowed me to overcome what some would perceive as learning limitations uh, and, and made me motivated to do things that I didn't really want to do. And I think for, for me now as I move forward and help people, uh, you look at the great resignation, quietly quitting. You look at people that just don't work anymore. Uh, it's because there's no connection with why. Uh, you know, we we have um, Simon Sinek famously uh, brought to the world the most obvious book you could ever read, which is the reason you do things, there has to be one. You have to understand why. But in today's busy world where we overwhelm our consciousness with information and noise, you, the what gets dumbed down the most uh, is the part of our processing and connection with our full neural system about emotion and, and feelings. And, and that's what's getting squashed. And, and leaders today need to be able to step back and re-engage that um, sense of belonging and sense of purpose to allow people to, you know, want to stay inside an organization um, so yeah, so that's a pretty long-winded answer, mate. Uh, I guess. Uh, Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> what What made me want to be a fighter pilot? I just i I was just going to be one. There was no doubt about determination, it. determination, decision made, purpose driven, determination done. But what I'm really intrigued to actually hear you talk about is that you had learning difficulties and you weren't great. But then a later diagnosis in adult life was it with the ADHD? How does that? How did that impact you and how does that play out in your life now? Because one thing that I know to be true is that labels can make people go one or two ways. And one is that they'll become a victim to it. And the other one is, is that they'll take it in their stride and find the superpowers of that label and work in around it. How has it impacted you finding that out later in life and how do you navigate it now or utilize it? Oh, look, it's been interesting. It, it, you, you, you see it for its strengths and weaknesses. Um, the, the, the amazing strength of ADHD or my version of ADHD, which is hyperattention rather than lack of attention, uh, is very much uh, the impact on others uh, because you are so focused, because you are so determined, um, and because you lack interest in just about anything other than what you're focused on, you, you have an impact on the people around you. You're, you're, you're not as patient. Uh, you, tend to, you tend to want to do things yourself. Uh, and, you know, for me, one of the reasons why I founded a number of companies is it's really exciting starting a company from nothing. But once it's up and running, it's kind of boring. Uh, and, you know, I let go of some some hugely valuable businesses due to lack of interest <laughs> more, than, more than anything else. Uh, and that's been great because that's helped me, you know, learn uh, one business was humanitarian sector. The other business was property development and construction. Another business was publishing. And, and today's kind of business is all about this. It's all about helping people uh, break through that, that membrane between who they are and who they want to be. Uh, and that's quite a, it's a, it's, it's a permeable membrane, uh, but it is, it's sticky. Uh, so, you know, I think now understanding it uh, and 
you know, I, I've written one book and by saying I've written, I had a ghostwriter help me. I'm, I'm writing a second book. Again, I'm getting a ghostwriter to help me because I lack the discipline of writing a book. I've got the ideas, I've got the research, but but crafting it. So, so for me, I'm, what I'm trying to do with, with the, my ADHD is trying to get to a point and, I, and I've got my mea culpa, the, the book, my legacy book, which, which I'm writing myself, um, which is kind of a five-year project on on neuroscience and the execution brain, is um, yeah, that's that's a struggle. That is like the hardest thing I've done is is try and have that discipline of academic rigor. Whereas my life is always about following a bouncing ball, being very goal driven, creating absolute clarity around execution. But when you start to talk about the the human brain and and performance and humanity it's a very vague topic and there is no there is no expert on any of that there is no expert on the brain there is no expert on the on our neural system on our nervous system there's you know even even cardiologists uh are are not experts of the heart they know what they know now but there's so much more that we don't Mm -hmm. know Uh, so it's quite you know, it's it. I, I now see the world in two. This, the world exists on two planes. There's the art and the creative, and the uncontrollable side, and then there's the bit we can control, uh, which is ultimately just you. So there's there's you and the decisions you make and the behaviours you exhibit and the things you believe in, and then there's the things you want. And you mentioned it before about there being a gap. So so life and successful people navigate that gap very well. There's always going to be collateral damage. There is no. There is no pathway where everything works perfectly, uh, so so we have to try and figure out well how do I how do I close that gap, how do I define the gap, and the smart people in life aren't the ones that create the goals, they're the ones that explore why the gap exists between what they want and where they are, and that's a very confronting conversation, uh, and for me where I was very lucky in life is as a fighter pilot. I learned how to have that conversation. I'd learned through 400 odd training missions to confront my own performance every single day, sitting in front of an instructor who was looking at me through a microscope one-on-one and over a period of, I guess, three or four years, you just learn to strip that layer off you, the the, the layer which hides things, the layer where you kid yourself, um, you know, the excuse layer. You just always confront your role in everything. Uh, and that's very, that's a hugely exciting place to be in life. Um, for me, that was very much a cognitive process. That was very much consciousness until about the age of 30, 32, when I met a spiritual healer who's a very successful property developer. He wasn't, he's not a spiritual healer. He, he doesn't do it. He just is one. He's just, he just works with doesn't even work with me. It doesn't cost anything. He's just a person that's super, super spiritually engaged. And through him is, is where I made the final kind of leap, I guess, between consciousness into unconsciousness and subconscious and spirituality, which is, you know, we are a construct of ourselves. Our ego is is what we believe we are, not who we are. Uh, and when you start to look at yourself, like you look at me, if I put my, if I looked at Boo through Robbo's eyes, that's a much healthier way to look at myself than through my own eyes. Uh, and that there, that post-ego kind of mindset as well uh, is also hugely powerful for you to manage your emotional states better and to and to, to see the world as, hey, it's, maybe it's not fair, but that's okay. What am I going to do about it? Mm, I love that. That's such a good um, philosophy. And I love that you've you've had that that experience that is leading you to more of the spiritual experiences. What I'm keen to hear you expand on is when you said that you were getting that feedback back so often when you were a fighter pilot, is that what you would call, I've heard you speak a lot about the the debriefing um, in those moments. And so I'd love to hear you talk about how you take that philosophy and into the work that you do now in with organizations or leaders and and you create these debriefing strategies why they're important what they involve and why everyone listening regardless of what position we're in in life should create these practices of debriefing because i come from a background of high performance sport working with olympic and paralympic athletes and in football codes and if you didn't debrief then 
you know, there's there's so many elements to performance in those areas and there's there's the training, there's the recovery, there's the sleep, there's the nutrition, there's the mindset. Debriefing is a big part of that for us to learn what went well, what didn't go so well, what why didn't it go so well and what are we going to do about it moving forward? Yeah, it's, it was interesting. I was having this conversation yesterday uh, because we're just going through a process of articulating, you know, the, the afterburner proposition in, in a way that is uh, different because most people have an understanding of what debrief debriefing is, but every every organization, sports team, their idea of debriefing is still not fighter pilot debriefings. What what we do isn't what most people perceive as as the debrief. And we've demonstrated this. We've demonstrated this by, you know, working with two NFL teams and both NFL teams won the Super Bowl because they did their debrief differently and you would know from high performance sport there's a lot of tape review there's a lot of discussion there's a lot of performance review but the thing that is different about debriefing and why it translates so well into sport and it obviously translates into the corporate world because anything that translates into performance anywhere translates across into the corporate space is fighter pilot debriefing is less is more we aren't looking for the 20 reasons why we didn't perform on that day we we're just looking Mm -hmm. for one and we'll stop the conversation when we find one reason why. Because it's not the reason why. It might be wrong. The reason why you did that actually might – what you perceive as the reason still might not be the right reason. And the only way we're going to figure out whether it's right or wrong is to do something about it, to take an action that directly mitigates that one thing. Uh, what, what I've certainly ob- observed in high-performance sport and where there's an opportunity for truly – there's another level of performance. I call it deep performance. High performance is what everyone does. So if you think about it, if everyone's high performing, why doesn't everyone win if we're all doing the same thing? So it doesn't work. So there's another layer called deep performance, which is the high performing teams and the high performing people who consistently outperform the high performers because that's never been defined before. No one's defined what it is about Michael Jordan what it is about the All Blacks, the the Chicago Bulls, the Tom Brady's of the world. What is it? The Ubers, the businesses that the Spotify's. No one's really defined what's the what's that extra layer, and that's where fighter pilots live. Fighter pilots live in a layer above high performance because we have to. You, you, we have a two percent margin for error. Uh, so we have to successfully achieve the mission 90% of the time. I can do basic math, even though I have ADHD. Uh, so that deep performance layer is this commitment to debriefing. That That's the major difference. Uh, and that is what Afterburner calls culturally nameless and rankless. Uh, so there's two other professions where you observe the importance of this type of conversation or this culture where we're just completely open and honest. The first one is doctors. So you speak to the average GP. When they're trying to diagnose a patient, most GPs will say generally patients lie, okay? So they'll lie about how much they drink or if they smoke or what the pain feels like or, you know, whether they've got a sore butthole uh, because it's embarrassing. So so what happens is doctors have to try and read between the lines there and they don't quite – it takes a couple of visits before they get to the bottom of it. The second one is police or detectives who really need uh, crystal clear information to be able to make decisions and shape an investigation. And they know that most witnesses, well, they would call it lying, but we just, what what it actually is, is just the brain reprogramming memories. You know, there's, you have to remember a lot in life. Uh, So the way the brain remembers is it creates stories. It doesn't, it doesn't map facts. So, and athletes are no different and neither are business leaders. Everyone creates a story and it's those stories that, that take us off, off piste that start to, that start to affect our ability. The stories around I'm not good enough. The stories around I'm always I always slice my shot. The stories around I can only jump that high. We only win in the second half. Like these stories are just perceptions. They're not real. So the only way you can break through a story is with reality. And reality comes from action. You you actually have to do things for you to say that is now real. I, I perceive poking this pen into my eye is going to hurt. But when I do it, well, I, I can now turn that from a perception into reality. 
it bloody hurt. Okay. So, so for the way the brain works though, is we, we tend to enjoy the, the perceptions and assumptions more. We love getting lost in these, in these fanciful futures. You know, we, we get lost in the, every team starts the season thinking they're going to win a grand final. Okay. Every, every team does that. No one goes into a foot, into a season saying, I'm going to be the wooden spoon, but there's always a wooden spoon and there's always a winner. So along in that journey, what deep performers do is they are in the here and now, right? And they're here and now in what they do, and they're here and now in what they did. One of the things I learned about ADHD was people with ADHD really struggle with the concept of now and later. So, so we don't really, we're very good at committing to do things and then realizing later, geez, I've got a lot on my plate. So you're always kind of busy, yeah? So I started to unpack time and how humans perceive time. And then what I started to learn was everyone's like that. No, humans cannot perceive time. We, we are not very good at understanding whether something takes an hour to do or six or a day or a week. And this is manifest in the number of projects that are done in anywhere in the... I've never done any project or anything that's been on time on budget. It just doesn't exist. It's super rare that things get done on time, uh, and that's and that's because we're trying to trying to to do something that we're not very good at doing, which is perceiving time. So the great thing about debriefing is the conversation connects the past, the present, and the future in the moment, like right now. And debriefing works like this: the reason you have goals is to debrief, not not to actually achieve them. Like achieving them is just the last small win. When you achieve a goal and you have a debrief culture, it's almost like you don't even feel it. It's just the last step on the ladder. Being a deep performer is actually not very exciting. It, it, there is no big rush of, of emotion. You just kind of get there, right? Uh, so when you look at, when you look at the, the, the Rafael Nadals, the Serena Williams of the world, the Ma Martina Navratilovas, you know, they are just exceptionally good at getting that last step. So when you talk about debriefing, you have to frame up the conversation. And as fighter pilots, we don't have goals. We have objectives because objectives are objective. There is, there is no interpretation. It's crystal clear. It's very easy to measure whether we're there or, or, or on the way, right? So we have objectives and then we have actions. That's it. We don't have priorities. We don't have big, audacious, hairy goals, strategic outcomes, Goals, smart goals, OKRs, KPIs, just one thing. Here's what I want and here's how I measure it. It's that simple. Uh, so that's what that's the that's the that's the that's the future that doesn't exist, right? I want it, but it doesn't exist. What does exist is what's just happened, my results. So what are my intentions? And what just happened? And I, I know what just happened because I just it I'm here. I can see it. I can see what my results are. And inevitably, on a journey to achieving your goal, every single day, you're not there yet. So there's always something to learn. So the, the, the third question we ask ourselves is why? Why am I here and not there yet? Uh, because it's day one on a 90-day program. So I've got 90 days to go. So that, that's why. Okay, that's fair enough. So where should I be? What is one ninetieth of my goal? Am I there yet? No, I'm zero. I've got nothing done. Okay, cool. Why? And because you're a human being, because you're complex and because the world is very complex, you will never be on top of things. Now, this this thing in the background here, we were talking about it earlier, Robo, mm. this helmet, uh, it's a million dollar helmet created for the modern day, what they call the fifth generation fighter pilot. And the fifth generation fighter pilot is a fighter pilot that's effectively connected to, to the matrix. Uh, and they are overwhelmed by information and they are overwhelmed by speed. So what this helmet does, it creates situational awareness. And that, that means that the helmet gives the pilot the right information at the right time to be able to make a decision. And those decisions equal the objectives. So if, if, if the pilot makes good decisions, they'll achieve the result. We do not have this concept of situational awareness outside of the Air Force. We have this concept of self-awareness, and, and that's great. That's all about you. But situational awareness is you in every situation that you find yourself in. Uh, and it's often a phrase used in self-defense, in combat, anywhere where your life is in peril, uh, people take situational awareness very seriously. 
So what that means is if it works when it's really important and your life depends on it, why wouldn't you just use it when it doesn't? Um, so this situational awareness, again, it, it's, it's about asking, you know, why? Why am I here now? What, what is one thing? Um, that one thing is what people would call a root cause analysis. They might call it the five whys. There's generally some kind of system around, you know, trying to problem solve stuff. The problem is you try and solve too much. You try and solve too much at once and you don't do anything about it. And I've observed that thousands of times in, in companies. So where, where it changes now, this is where we shift gear. This is why the fighter pilot debrief is different. Because the next step in the fighter pilot debrief is coming up with an action. Not an action for a team, not an action for the organization, not an action for your wingman. It's an action for you. And it's one thing, maybe it's three things, but no more than three things. But it's one thing you make a, a 100% commitment, not a 99% commitment, 100% commitment to do on the next mission or to do the next day. Uh, it, it might be something small, like it, it might be that you've, you've, we tie our pens to our kneeboard uh, and, and we have all of our documents strapped to our knees because there's obviously no table in a, in a fighter jet, right? And that, that pen might have, the ink might be running out. And you've known the ink's been running out. It's slowly getting there. And then on today's mission, the ink finally ran out. So your action is to leave that room, get a new pen, tape it up and put it in before you leave, right? Not tomorrow, I'll do my pen tomorrow. Because you just, that's what you've been doing. That's, you've done that already for the last two weeks. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty naff kind of uh, lesson. A more complex lesson might be, at what altitude, what distance, what weapon configuration, what weather. You might have 16 different inputs into a perfect moment in time where you can just by one tenth of a second outshoot your opponent and it means you get a kill on the opponent before you do and you get to come home safely. That's a complex action, but at what that will come down to is a moment in time. Your action is to get to that exact moment in time tomorrow employ that weapon in training, like you're not going to actually shoot a weapon or pretend one, and then come back and debrief it again tomorrow. So we have as fighter pilots, uh, in fact, they tell you this when you start fighter pilot training, they say anyone can be a fighter pilot given enough time and given enough resources. Anyone can be a fighter pilot. But we've only got so much budget and so much time for you to be a fighter pilot, 400 odd missions. And that, that therefore creates a, an accelerated learning curve which means every day you show up, you are deliberately pushed outside your comfort zone. And at the end of the day, the two or three pilots that graduate um, out of the 30 that start are the pilots that manage to sit on that curve all the way without falling off. Mm. Now, some pilots fall off and, and they leave. They, they disappear that afternoon. You never see them again. Uh, and others go and fly different airplanes. But the whole system is designed to train fighter pilots because that's the hardest environment for a human being to operate in. Um, so, so the debrief is what you use to stick on the learning curve because the actions you take demonstrate that you've learned something that afternoon or the day before. You might do two missions in a day. So you might be, you, those actions that you just discovered, you, you'll be applying them within an hour on the next, on the next iteration, on the next step on the ladder. Uh, no debriefing, you just come straight off that ladder straight away. And one of the challenges in fighter pilot training is a lot of talented pilots get washed out because they've got the hands and feet, the natural ability. And you see this in sport all the time where you have a talented athlete that never achieves their full potential, but they don't have the humility to learn. And average fighter pilots that are exceptional at debriefing outperform talented fighter pilots with poor debriefing all the time. Interesting. What do you put that down to and how can people relate that into our own lives to, to help us make progress based on what you're just saying there and what you've experienced working with hundreds, if not thousands of people with these debriefing processes? The challenge you need to solve right now, particularly post COVID and the digital um, revolution that occurred is you have to solve that everything everywhere all the time problem. Okay. At the moment, we, we perceive that we have to consume and do everything right now all the time, which is why everyone's so tired. Uh, and, and that's thanks to the overwhelming amount of information you're now served, uh, which, which never existed before. Uh, so that's the first thing. So, so the best way to figure out what do I need to do now is to incorporate debriefing. Uh, 
one of the actions that comes from debriefing is also what am I trying to do? Like, so you might say my intention is to get three podcasts done today. Uh, and it's been your intention for six weeks. For six weeks now, you've got two, maybe two and a half done, and you just can't nail three a day. So the debrief there after six weeks would be not how do I do three podcasts a day? It will be stop trying to do three podcasts a day. Do two. Reset your expectations. Frustration and emotion and fatigue comes from constantly striving for an expectation that's never going to be met. Um, and this is the problem with stretch goals or, or un, unachievable goals. It's a challenge in sport because often when a team's performing well and they're achieving all their goals, the goals will arbitrarily be increased for no reason. And then that actually creates a negative uh, effect on the on the well-being of everyone because all of a sudden you go from a team of, high, of outperformers to a team of underperformers. And nothing happened apart from the coach changing the, changing the goalposts. Mm. Uh, but the psychological effect of that is huge. So if you translate that into life, if you, if you are constantly failing to meet expectations, you are going to constantly be frustrated. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's some truth to the statement, ignorance is bliss. If you have no expectations, if you don't want anything, you're generally happier. That's, that's generally a, a, a rule of thumb. The more you want, the harder you strive, the more you tend to find that pool of people suffering from anxiety and depression. So that's not to say give up and have zero expectations. This is a this is an art form. There is no to be a high performer is a is a challenge that you are going to set for yourself and for your partner and your life forever. You are you are always going to be trying to blend uh, what you want to what you can achieve and not being a dickhead at, at the same time. <laughs> it's very easy to be successful and be an asshole. That's actually very. Mm, you see plenty of those examples. Yeah, and they're in the air force too. You know, you you would you would fly. What I always prided myself on in the air force is when, whenever I flew with a new pilot, uh, they would always say to me, "Gosh, flying with you as a senior pilot is so different to everyone else." It's like I really enjoy flying with you, and and to me that's important. Like to find joy in what you do is just as important as being good at what you do. Um, and there's lots of stories about that. You know, there's there's plenty of people that have had an amazing career, and then when they finish it, they go. The thing I, I, I regret the most was I didn't enjoy the moment. I didn't enjoy any of it. On, I just uh, Michael Jordan. Yeah. Says it. On that note, because um, you said there before so that's, that that's what you need with to be, like deep performers. Uh, there's none of those big emotions. It's kind of just like, yep, that next step is that's the great achievement. And the crowd or the other people around they see this as, oh my god, that's amazing, and they get more of the the big emotions that come with it. So how do we then bring? Uh, the achievement of the, not the goals, but the, um, what did you say? You don't say you have goals, you have uh, objectives. So objective task, we do the task. Objectives. Objective is met. So therefore. No tasks. There's no tasks. Oh, what did you have? So you have the objectives. There's no and tasks. If you, if you. Action, sorry. Action, sorry. Action. Yeah, so you take the action. Objective achieved. Action. And so deep performers don't really get those big emotions because it's almost like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen because I'm focused on that and that's just the next step in the picture and all of a sudden it's this big goal that's achieved. How do we bring the joy and the big emotions, like what you said, to those achievements as uh, as when we're doing deep performance? This is, this is where you can start to unlock the parts of the brain that we don't think about, but they're very powerful, right? So, so – if you there's a there's a brain model called the triune brain right which effectively says this the brain has three elements to it there's the lizard brain uh, there's the which is the the primal brain the emotional brain there's the 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 mid brain or the or the limbic system uh, which is sort of your behaviors and what I, I just call it it's like your autopilot it's your subconscious and then there's the conscious brain the bit that you can control uh, when you look at the amount of neural energy and that's my little plasma ball there if you look at the amount of neural energy um, expended under an fMRI it's the the, li the limbic and the uh, lizard brains that are that are very very energetic and there's a lot of neural activity there more so than what's in in our conscious brain um, this is a massive oversimplification of how the brain works I'm not I'm not sitting here telling you how the brain works this is just a way of conceptualizing yep, it, got right? it so when it comes to joy when it comes from emotion and if you look at psychologists if you look at um, psychology and neuroscience there's a general there's a general rule of thumb where an emotion, has a physiological response, a feeling doesn't. 
So a feeling is a, is a thought-based response to your environment, but your heart rate doesn't go up, you don't start sweating, you don't, you don't have a biological response, whereas an emotion is. You know? uh, some psychologists say there's six or seven emotions, others say there's 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to feelings, there's like 34,000 odd combinations of feelings. Yeah. Mm. So, so even deep perform so deep performers don't seek the joy. They don't set the hugely ambitious target to get the joy to to earn the joy. What happens is they get it as a byproduct of the really? achievement. It's you win, your lizard brain kicks in because everyone's yelling and screaming around you. There's a whole lot of human to human connection going on. And boom, you get caught in the moment and you get dopamine released, oxytocin, serotonin and endorphins. All of these responses that are done by uh, an autopilot, you've got no control over it. And it's like taking drugs. An endorphin is like morphine. It's the similar class of, of response in the body. So that then becomes what you call the intrinsic motivators. So that then just sits in the background. The deep performer is not seeking it. The, the, the deep performer, it's not the end state, isn't the emotion. The emotion is the byproduct of the effort. So again, let's just stick with Michael Jordan, yeah, and the, and the Bulls. So Michael Jordan won, not because he wanted to, because he did an extra hour of practice every day. Mm. Like, it's not hard. It's, it's, the, it's the small day-to-day -day small wins. If, if, if uh, I was speaking to some, I was working with a mortgage-broking firm yesterday, uh, and we're, we're talking about uh, how to increase the, the millions of dollars that they bring in, right? Uh, and there's a perception that there's just only so much. There's only so much that can come in. There's only 10 million, 10 million, that's it. We've tried for years, we can't break through 10 million. So, okay, cool. So what do you do to get 10 million calls? Well, so to, to get $10 million, well, I do 100 calls a week, I make eight appointments, and of those eight appointments, I get two deals. Okay, cool. Right. What if you did 120 calls? What do you mean? Well, if you did a hundred, oh, I don't have time to do 120 calls. I'm like, okay, okay, hang on. But if, how long does it take you to do hundred calls? Two hours, right. So if you did 20 minutes more a week, just 20 minutes to, to do the extra calls and that's 20% more calls, would you get 20% more revenue? Would you climb to $12 million? Mm, uh, probably not. Why not? What is different? From the 100 calls that you make to the 20 extra, what's different? Well, nothing. Okay, so you make 100 calls, you get $10 million. And for some perceived reason, 20 more calls is going to be completely different and you're going to get nothing? Uh, maybe. So, so let's go backwards. $2 million, reverse engineer that back to 20 minutes. So... Your bill out rate, $2,000 per hour, is that, that's what it equates to. So what you're saying is you couldn't be bothered earning an extra $600, $800 for that 20 minutes of time. You couldn't be bothered. You don't need that money. And then the fortnight later, we made the extra 20 calls. Guess what's happened? Oh, my gosh, we've got $12 million. Mm. But for... Years, that perception for years, this perception of a ceiling existed. And that's the difference between what we want and what we do and why we don't connect it very well. So when we start to connect that a little bit better to what I want, to what I do today, that's when the magic starts to happen. And guess what happens? Then there'll be a belief system that's created. We can't do more than 12 million. That's what happens, right? That's, the, that's what you do. But that's why you have in some mortgage brokers are doing $25 million a month and others are doing two. Mm. It's just the story that that broker is telling themselves. You're, you are the product of the story that you tell yourself. And when it, comes to, when it comes to the two phases of time, what you want and what you do, what you want is a story. What you do is write the book. Brilliant. That's the difference, right? And what I'm saying here is not it's not it's not like crazy left field shit. It's like pretty obvious if you think about it. But 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 the challenge with being busy all the time, the challenge with doing everything everywhere all the time is you forget common sense. You you step back and you don't do 
the most basic things in the world. Debriefing is a four-step process. And people go, oh, boo, man, I would love to debrief. I just don't have time. And it's like, yeah, you don't have time because you're not debriefing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the problem. Um, I'm keen to hear what the four steps are, but what I'm really intrigued about is these story pieces. So I love this shit and this is what I work on with people and uh, this understanding of our, you know, our disempowering stories, our limiting beliefs. Um, they've been titled as upper limit problems. I sometimes call them bullshit stories, whatever we want to call them in terms of the, the disempowering ones, these ones that create this ceiling, this percep- this story, this perception that creates this glass ceiling above us. From your experience not just as a fighter pilot, but then stepping out and taking these philosophies into the lives of people uh, in corporate, in business, leaders, people. What do you find is the the greatest strategies to help us rewrite these stories that are creating these limiting perceptions? One of one of the byproducts of uh, of ADHD. There's a whole everyone's version of that is different, right? Uh, But one of the one of the byproducts of ADHD is that you're not really uh, high on consequences. You, you don't really think about it too much. You, you don't, in a hyper-focused mode, you don't really worry if anything could go wrong. So, so I was probably gifted with that. Uh, so my stories, and I've had four stories, right? So my first story is the story of Boo the Fighter Pilot. Um, so that story that story was, was written by me uh, and uh, I just lived the story. Okay. The second story was to be a multi-millionaire entrepreneur. Uh, and that was the story. Uh, how I did it was I moved to Afghanistan and went where there was no competition because that's what I had to do. I, I couldn't start something in Australia. I didn't know how the, any business worked here. Or, so I knew, I knew in those sort of countries that you know, I'm a valuable resource because I, I know how to get things done. And if the country's just finished a war, there's plenty to do. So that that so that story was to yeah you know, I, I fulfilled that story. That's what I became, uh, and that was in humanitarian sector. So that was also a good story. It was helping people. Mm-hmm. The next story was to be a property developer, uh, and that resulted in building a 17-story hotel built in record time in Perth, 120 rooms using um, a totally m- new construction technique called volumetric prefabricated modular construction. My next story was a story that came out of left field. I guess it's probably more like a chapter in a book. And that was to buy a magazine that was the biggest magazine uh, for aviation in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, And it was slowly going out of business through no fault of the owner. It's just tough, tough, tough time to be in magazines. Uh, And turned that around into a a pretty significant digital publishing business and sold it. And the next story is, is the story I have now. Uh, and that story is, and you can't, the universe also intervenes, right? There's a bit of karma here. There's a little bit of, whilst you know what the story is, the, the, the pages are always going to be different. So the fact I'm here owning a business now called Afterburner, which is using fighter pilot methodologies to be successful in life, is I'm the human embodiment of the story. Like it actually works. It's not a theoretical example. So now my story is help people believe this. Help people take the byproduct of a $15 million program and help coach them so they think this way every single day. Because I think differently from most humans. And that the, the, the book I'm writing, my, my, I guess the mere culpa is, it's called the evolution of thinking. It's the human 2.0. There's a totally different way, a bit like this helmet, that you can process information. Uh, so that to me is the final chapter in my story because that I will go to my grave trying to help people do that because it is, a, it is an enormous mountain. And you would know if you're trying to help people achieve their goals, there's billions of people in the world with Billions of different goals, which means it doesn't matter how much you do, you'll never get to everyone. So that to me is 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 helping people think a different way uh, that actually works. It's that's delivered the life I want. Uh, it's not it's not an easy life. It's not a perfect life. It's not every day. There's challenges and 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 conflict and all the other stuff that happens. But that's the difference. Deep performers, despite all of that, you get there. So for me. 
winning isn't like, yay, I won. And people say, often say to me, you've got no emotions. And I'm like, I do, but it's like, I've won a lot, you know. I, have, I haven't won NRL because I didn't go there because I don't, that's not, I can't be in that story because I don't have the muscles and the, and the motivation for the exercise. So that's, that's not my story. So you've got, to, you've got to write a story that's realistic. You know, it's not, it's not, you're not writing The Hobbit here. You're writing your biography. It's, 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 it's different. So you've got to write the story where, where you can see yourself as a character in the book where you don't need to have a Superman cape or, or magic happens and then I achieve my goal. There's, there's got to be no magic. Mm. Um, magic does happen sometimes, but that's just a free kick. That's just an accelerator. That's just something that happens that's, that's exciting. Uh, but you can't rely on magic happening. Uh, another story someone told me was the key to success is just playing the game long enough. Uh, particularly for deep performers. If you're in business long enough, something will happen that will transform your business. If you're in a sport for long enough, something will happen that will transform your your uh, sporting career. And that happens both ways. That happens with the with the star athlete that uh, has an ACL injury that never gets never comes mm. good again. It might be the story we see with Tom Trebojevic, where you might be the most amazing player in the world, but your body just can't. Your body, you're just engineered beyond your body's capability. But that's okay. That's just that's just the, the, the hero's journey changes. Uh, so I think a lot of people give up on their story. I think a lot of people, they, they, they're scared to write a story. So they just, they just become a chapter in their mum and dad's story uh, or their sister's story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you've got to lean into your own story and give it 10 years, you know, from the age of five to 22, my first story took 17 years and it's still, it's still being written, still wearing a flying suit, still talking about it, you know, 17 years after that. So what I'm hearing you say with the story aspect then, Boo, because I was thinking about the small daily stories that we tell ourselves that prevent us from living our ideal life. Like, yeah, I really want that, but I'm not good enough. I really want that, but I'm not talented enough. I really want that, but it's too hard. I really want that, but I'll go over to this distraction instead. But you're more talking about the the writing of the book, like the bigger story in itself and creating a lot of clarity around that and conviction around that. You have to have the big story that, the, the, the big story is how you, is how you uh, reimagine your beliefs, right? So it's, it's your beliefs that, that are the molasses of every day. It's what you believe about yourself. It's what you, what you believe about the world. And, and that's, that's actually less of a story and more like a textbook uh, because, because you believe it. It's, it's, it feels mm-hmm. real. It doesn't, a, a story isn't real. A story is, is an adventure. A story is what you want, right? Your, your beliefs, you need to be scientific about. You, you, you're not going to, and this is the, whilst I'm a positive thinker and I believe the power of positive psychology, it's a story. To, to genuinely change behaviors and, and debriefing, if you look at it in terms of a similar application in psychology, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the same technique you would use to, to cognitively conquer an emotion but what you're doing is you're cognitively creating new actions to modify behavior. Mm. And, and what I certainly find interesting, and again, this is what you learn as a fighter pilot, is the actions and the behaviors you exhibit to be incredibly safe deliver phenomenal performance. So if you translate that to psychology, the therapies and the techniques psychologists use to keep people psychologically safe are also incredibly powerful for High performance, and and I have a problem with some of the high performance experts in the arena with how they frame up high performance. I think a lot of the high performance models are exhausting. Uh, I think a lot of high performance mm. models are damaging long term, which is why you have the damaging effect of people who pop out the back end of high performance sport, and they end up with major psychological issues or uh, substance abuse issues. Because that version of high performance is the is the win at all cost version of high performance, right? That's not, and, and you will win. You you will win at a win at all cost. You will absolutely win, eventually, and then mm. you'll be busted. You, you cannot win at all cost all the time. And deep performing teams, 
win more than others, but they never win at all cost. Uh, and and that to me, like a lot of the a lot of the Jocko Willixes, a lot of the uh, Insta Insta high performance is, you know, heavy hard beat music, get the anger up, and you got to do whatever you got to win at all costs. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, you'll win, you'll win, but it's it's going to be a it's going to be not fun for anyone. It's not going to be fun for you. And you're probably never going to do it again because it sucks so mm, much. And you can't. Let's go back to the, the yep. beliefs, right? So go back to beliefs. So 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 the only way you can the only way you can change your belief is to do something that shows you that it's not true. So you have to do so, you have to show some action. If you believe you're scared of heights, you're not going to change that unless you repel off a mountain or do something where you're safe in that environment. Mm. I'm scared of heights, which is, I guess, probably strange. Uh, I get, I get vertigo, but guess what? I get that because I'm a survivor. I get that because it's stupid to be on the edge of a cliff. That's high risk, right? So to be afraid of things like that is normal. However, as a fighter pilot, and when you do your basic training, they throw you off a cliff all the time. <laughs> like you're constantly getting thrown off cliffs, right? Uh, because it's a metaphor to say. Have you done the risk analysis? Are you connected to a rope? Did you listen to the briefing? Do you understand now that it is safe to do this in this, do it this way and then do it. What, you, what you've what you just done is you've mm. jumped through the membrane. You've jumped through the membrane of what you believe to be true to what is actually true. Uh, and if you don't constantly, uh, but you need support to do it. You can't just randomly go and jump through. You, you, you can, but you're probably a high risk person. If you're the person that just constantly pushes their pushes their comfort zone all the time, you'll probably be dead before everyone else. And there's plenty of you know mountain climbers and and uh, free climbers and and X game athletes that are phenomenally broken for doing it by themselves. Right? Could the opposite Second, be? You'll still get to there. that without the support. You you'll try to push it and you'll try to push that membrane but without the support with someone like yourself, a professional to actually give you some tools and strategies to allow you to actually really break through it because it might be like, I'm almost there and I don't like that feeling. And then the stories or the doubt or the, the other kind of fear comes in. So it could be that that's why you need support as well to actually get you through it. You've got control of around 50 thoughts a second, right? 25 to 40,000 thoughts a day. And, and if you think you can control that and that they're all good thoughts, and you're in the driving seat, kidding yourself. <laughs> that's why we create beliefs. That's why we that's why we create self-limiting mm. beliefs. Because otherwise you're gonna go insane. You, 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 can't un, you can't let the brain run around at that speed. However, as a fighter pilot, you do have to tap into that a little bit. You do have to tap into that extra potential because because of the speed of things. So 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 you need to learn how to do it. You need to learn how to unlock the full potential of the brain, right? To to bring the three systems together as one. So when it comes to doing it by yourself and if you put everything into it, you will probably win. Like I'm not saying that, 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 that the high performance stuff that's out there or, or some of the belief systems are wrong. Yeah, I'm talking about winning in life though. I'm talking about sustained excellence, mm. not, not sustainable coming second all the time. I mean sustainable winning. Uh, and, and, you, and sustainable winning still means you're going to lose. <laughs> But you're going to win more than more more than you lose. Uh, a great book is Jim Collins, "Good to Great." Right? Like if you're if you're looking for a, like a really simple book that explains some of the basic habits and 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 disciplines around being successful, that's what he talks about. Where uh, Moneyball, another great example, mm. right? Where uh, and, a, and a great coach in Australia for Moneyball is someone like Wayne mm. Bennett, who's who's not looking for the star player; he's just looking for the best stats at at, at each collectively, right? And, and a fighter pilot is money ball. We're not stacking the team with champions and we're not stacking the team with talent. We're, we're stacking the team with the best athletes with what they need to do that raises the entire average. Uh, and that, that philosophy works. Why don't we do it? Why do people still invest in talent? Why do people still go down the, the route of throwing the dice and hopefully winning? Because... They're the people that are addicted to the adrenaline. That's that's again, it's gambling. Mm. It's it's another form of gambling. 
Uh, it's just, it's just justified, uh, and and people are looking for that high. They they're looking they're looking. I guess yeah. To use your analogy, they're looking for the story every day, rather than the than the the story the story of their Going life. Going back to tapping into the full potential of the brain, how do we do that? Debriefing. That's what it does. That's that's where we take and, and cognitive behavioral therapy. It's where you're taking emotions and feelings, things you can't control, into what you can control, your cognitive mm. capacity. Uh, so, what are the four steps to debrief that you kind you, of brief? The re- oh, sorry, just a story has to have a feeling, right? So a belief is a feeling, uh, and and at the latest kind of, uh, I guess, thoughts around how we create beliefs is we have around two hundred beliefs or, or cognitive biases that that we use to filter information the brain is a filter right that's mm-hmm. just what it is like it it takes in a lot it has to filter it and and give you filtered information for you to make a decision because you cannot make 50 decisions a second so so the more efficient and clean your filters are the better your decision comes right so those belief systems uh need to be constantly constantly cleaned up uh and, and you know, as someone that's in a third lifelong relationship and had uh, some some pretty horrendous kind of relationships, I, my belief system could be that being in a relationship is not is not good. But that's not true. That what happened in those circumstances were very much specific to the environment uh, and specific to me, probably having ADHD and my hyper focus. There's a lot of other elements to it. So I can I'm a, I can make a choice to believe that relationships are shit and you can never be in one. Or I can believe I had a role to play. I can believe there is opportunities for great relationships to be out there. Uh, I, I had one business that that uh, didn't go. The hotel that we built, you know, we built that straight into COVID, so we had to sell it. Lost a lot of money. So I can believe that oh, being a business owner is stupid. You lose money. Or I can believe that that was just a bit of bad luck, bad timing. Get back on the horse and keep going. Uh, so so so. If you just tell yourself those stories without doing anything, you you can't change beliefs. A story a story doesn't change anything. A story is a path. It's it's just a direction to go in. To to actually navigate the path, you have to do things. You have to dig holes, move rocks, mo- go around trees, chop down a tree. You've got to do a whole lot of actions. So when it comes to debriefing, your intent is the story. What do I want? Your results, where are you at? There's a forest in the way. Uh, why is there a forest in the way? Well, because I just don't have binoculars. I couldn't see it, you know. Uh, do I want to go through the forest or do I want to go another way? Well, I'll tell you what. My first action is going to be to try another way, okay? So my action is to go down that path and see what happens. That's all I can do right now. I, I can't make any more decisions now. I, I can't say I'm going to go down this pathway and then my story is going to be written. Maybe it will be. I don't know. I don't know. I've got to do the action. I do the action. I walk down the pathway. Something happens. Uh, there's a creek in the way. Uh, a bridge has fallen down. Or, oh my gosh, there's that. I, I just got to my goal faster than I thought it was. Um, so what? What other people do though is they'll sit there and they go, "Oh, there's a forest in the way. Well, I better cut down the trees and go through the forest and create all this work, all this activity, and go through and eventually get to the end of the forest and they've gone the wrong way." Or they'll go, oh, well, the forest is there. I'm just going to turn around and go back, start again. And then, and then go on another path way back there. I don't know what the right answer is for anyone's life. No one does. Because it's not until you do the actions that you, and, you, and you just do thousands of actions in your life, tens of thousands of actions. And of those tens of thousands of actions, hopefully 5,001 were right and 4,999, well, they weren't right. But, hey, you got there mm. in the end. Without the action, there is no change. Oh, hang on. Don't even get me started on change. There is no change. Without the action, there's no evolution. You, you, are, you, are, a, you are an evolutionary body. You are designed to evolve. You can accelerate that through debriefing or you can evolve on a generation-by-generation generation basis. But whatever happens, you're going to evolve. The same story about the fighter pilot. Uh, eventually, you're going to become a fighter pilot, but we need you to evolve fast. That's all we've got the budget for. Mm. Life is the same. You've only got so many years. Like you, you, you can't you can't put it off. Like eventually you're gonna you're gonna be pushing up daisies. So there is always a constraint. Um, and, and there's a there's a seminal study that was done about five years ago, 
it was the most comprehensive review globally on high performers, right? And what they were trying to what they were trying to disprove disprove was that was the fact that people perceive high performance as being a bell curve, like all the high performers live in the middle, and then you've got extreme high performers on one side, and you've got you know the the less performers down this side. Uh, so 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 that was that was effectively it. But but the opposite is true. It's 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 not a bell curve. Ten uh, percent of the world delivers twenty five percent of the outcome. That's that's what that's the disproportion. And the bottom twenty five percent delivers ten percent. And in that study of six hundred and thirty eight thousand high performers, they discovered that in that world, on average, those people get four hundred percent more done in life than everyone else. Wow. So that's that's the potential, right? So so right now, if you're not sure where you're going to find the time, you don't believe that that you can get there. Well, you've got four times more you can achieve in a week if you change the way that you think. And if you don't know a way of thinking, you don't know how to do it. Well, debriefing is the way. Some people debrief naturally. Yeah, like Dyson. If you look at the vacuum, the hair dryer, the hair curler, the the hand dryer, by default, they have the scientific method and they're debriefing and taking action all the time. Most of us don't have it though. Most of us have never taught it. Most of us have never even heard about it. Most of us have no need to to apply scientific method or cognitive behavioral therapy or anything. We just we just basically bimble through life and wait for magic to happen. Debriefing is your tool. And debriefing is the conversation you have with yourself. If you're feeling emotional, if you're feeling stuck, if you don't know how to prioritize, anytime you feel stuck, sit down, debrief in that moment right there. Right there what right are the, the four steps to debriefing in all of those situations? Do you use the same four steps each time? You mentioned it there a while back. I'm just really keen to, to hear what they are so we can start practicing debriefing and, and making this progress. Intention, result, reason, action. That's it. What's my intention? What's my result? What's the reason I have this result? And what's my action right now to fix it? Mm. That's it. That is it. The more you do that with someone else, the more accountable you are to someone else in that conversation, the better it is. Again, your self-limiting beliefs will influence the way that you debrief. And that's why coaches are so important, right? Uh, you don't You don't need a coach. Just someone else, some a friend. Uh, but just remember, uh, most people tend to be friends with people who are nice to them and don't tell them anything <laughs> bad. Uh, so make sure it's a you know a real friend. Um, but but even better, find a community of people that are committed to performance. There's plenty of coaching communities out there. Plenty of business coaches. Just find someone. Invest in someone. Uh, you know, I. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day. I mean, for what I do, I, I you know, I charge an absolute mozza for it, right? Uh, so for some people, it's like, can't do it and, 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 and I can't help them. But as I say to them, I'm like, hey, you know, if you can't find 500, uh, 500 bucks a month to invest in yourself, mm. to give you 400% more mm. output, then you, you've just created a self-limiting belief, okay? And anyone can find, you, you, you don't even need money. They're, they're on Facebook, Right, reach out to reach out to somebody in a community on Facebook and say, "Hey, I see you're in this community. I'm thinking about getting in there. I'm really struggling with accountability and budget right now. You know, do you mind if I have a chat with you? And even if it's 15 minutes a week, that's all you need, right? Uh, but again, if your story is, "I want what I want out of life," your actions are you have to exhibit the deep performing behaviors. You will eventually figure it out. You will eventually find the right people. You, you, it's, it's not like buying a can of Coke. It's not like, I want a can of Coke. I go to a vending machine, I get a can of Coke. That's not, that's not a story. Um, your story is the, the journey of misadventure, the mistakes, the, 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 the things that you, you, you do wrong as much as the things that you do right. But what you don't want to do is get caught in the habit of doing the wrong things and not learning from it or doing the same wrong things all the time. Uh, and because life is busy, because it's hectic, because of the information overload, because of the passivity we're experiencing now as a result of, of uh, astonishing consumption of information, 
it is easier just to it is easier to rock back in the chair. It is it is easier not to write the book. Um, <laughs> and and I know what trying to write a book is. It is hard. <laughs> well, speaking of hard. journey and, um, and but taking to do action hard on things, your, you've got to have small on your wins. Story, sorry there to to cut you off. To, um, taking action on your story, you are moving to America very soon within the next couple of months of this recording. What? Why mm. are you moving there? What's taking you there in regards to you uh, fulfilling? This, this path of your new story? Is it to immerse yourself in more high-performance environments? Is it using technology to find out what's really going on with brain and neurochemistry and brainwave frequencies and things like that? What What is it that America is providing for you that uh, you're not able to get on this this path of your story here in Australia at the moment? So my, my story is to help people be successful and experience what life is like when you're in... I wouldn't say control of it, but but when you're navigating it well, right? And and I made that decision when I was building the hotel before I'd even heard of Afterburner. So so my story was was to help people, and I was just going to become a you know just a run of the mill life coach, and that was that was good for me. And I started exploring that, uh, and then I made a phone call to a friend of mine who was running Afterburner in Australia, and I uh, and I said, hey Phil, how are you going? I said, look, I've just finished building this hotel. Uh, you know, I've been around business for a little while. Would you like me to help you out, mate? I'll, I'll just come and help and speak and, you know, just have a bit of fun. And he said, oh, good timing. He says, I've been running it for 12 years and I just decided I want to go be a fighter pilot again. Do you want hmm. to take it over? Like literally in that phone call. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll come and have a look. And I took it over. Cool. So I'm, I'm running along now. I'm, I'm running Afterburner. I bought a magazine on the side. So I'm running my magazine, doing this stuff. I'm seeing the effect it's having on people and businesses. I'm like, wow, this stuff is like working. And, and I'm getting phone calls years after a presentation. And hey, I just wanted to let you know, my whole construction company now runs on plan brief, execute debrief. Look at all the documents. Can you have a look at it? I'm like, holy smokes, like one hour in front of these people and it's transformed their entire business. I'm like, this is pretty cool. And then I started to, then I, so, so after Ben is very much, this is you know, a bit like the Mandalorian. This is the way, right? It's, it, it is, it's the way. And if you do the way, the results are great. Uh, but then I started to think, why was it the way? Uh, and then I started to build my own brand, um, which is Call Me Boo. And and my brand is all about the neuroscience and, the, and unpicking it a little bit, which was, hey, fighter pilots, we kind of accidentally ended up with this. Well, not accidentally. We just killed thousands of pilots uh, by accident uh, to come up with this system. But what's the, what's the science behind it? And that journey is – that's underway. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, and then you know, I got on the phone call to the to the owner of Afterburner at the end of, end of last year, and I'm saying, "Hey, mate, how you going?" In America, a guy called Murph, super smart guy, uh, and he said, "I think I'm, you know, I think I'm done. I think I've had enough of this." Uh, and and I'm like, "Oh, cool. Um, would you sell it if I bought it off you?" You know, uh, and he's like, mm, "Well, yeah, if you give me an offer, and yeah, I bought it." So again, it's not these are chapters. This is not the story. It's just mm. the chapters, right? Um, and, and then from there, it was like, okay, well, now I can, now, now, because I was, I just had the, I just used the IP under license, right? Like it was, it's not my IP, it's it's Murph's and, and Afterburners. So now I've bought that IP, I can start to meld my IP and Afterburners IP to, to, to really start to craft the art and science, you know, the, the storytelling and the action, the objectives and the action, I can start to craft that in, into a more diverse distribution. In, in, it's a singular story, but it needs to be told in different ways. You know, the story of Star Wars, of Lord of the Rings, uh, they're all the same. They're, it's the same story. There's good guys, there's bad guys. The good guys own everything. The bad guys don't. They're good people. A whole bunch of actions happen and ta-da, look at that. The good guys win, right? So, so it's all the same kind of story. Uh, and even uh, if you if you if you read about George Lucas, that he the story of Star Wars was second to the hero's journey. He knew if he wrote a story that was the hero's journey, then whatever it was, people would watch mm. it. And and it's yeah, it's like the the same. Every number one song has the same three chords in it. You know, there's just some kind of like there's just some visceral thing about humanity that connects with these big stories. Uh, so. There was no thought, there was no conscious thought expended at all to get to the destination of being in America to be given a much larger platform in which to share my story. Mm. The universe looked after it for me. 
Okay. It presented the opportunity. It, it, it said to me, make a decision. And it was a tough decision because I've got family and there's, there's good, it's not an easy decision. There's a lot, there's a lot that gets upended in my life because of this decision. But does it, does it write the story? Does it share something I fundamentally believe in with as many people as possible to make the world a better place? It does. So that's, I have to make the decision based on that. Then I can, then I've got a reason. I'm not just upending and leaving some kids over here and going, I've got a reason for doing it. I can explain it properly. I can, I can bring everyone else along for the journey and, and let them know that I still love, every, I still love you and you're, I think you're amazing and we can stay connected. You know, um, I've got people over here that are dependent on me in the afterburn of business. So I can empower them. So it's all with the story. Everyone else becomes a character in your story. They're not just left out mm. all of a sudden. No story. There's nowhere to bring anyone along with you. If you have no story, then everyone wonders what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why are you being mean to me? Why are you leaving me? Yeah. Everyone needs to be a and character. And it sounds like you're um, great at uh, intuitively picking up the phone at the right time to, to ring people for those opportunities. But I, I understand what you mean about the, the universe is, is with you sometimes. I'm going to wrap up shortly, but I just wanted to hear it's from you. you all the um, time. It is, it is, it is always the with universe you. is always with you. The, the universe is, it's not there sometimes it is there. And don't get me wrong. I, I didn't start this way. Right. I didn't, I didn't have the perception of, of, of the, of the universe. Mm. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't get it. I was just, I was very focused, task focused, outcome focused. Right. It wasn't until I, you know, as I said, I met Joe sort of 32, uh, that, that I, that I changed that. But, but when you start to understand, you don't need to have a God, you can have a God or not have a God. You can, you can have a religious belief, you know, that's all great and, and more power to you. You might be right. You might be wrong. Not, we can't all be right, but there is a, there is a spirituality. There is, there is a bigness, mm. a bigness in the world. Um, and, and if you're well intentioned, which is why debriefing, you require the intention. If you, if you're well intentioned, I, I could sit here, mate, for three hours and tell you the most, random things that have happened to me in my life at the right time zero planning because the universe is with mm. me on this what some people might know as serendipity i'm just intrigued and this is a whole another conversation that we could have i can see where this this comes from and where it could go and i, I love that kind of stuff uh before we wrap up though i'm intrigued to know from your workshops that you run do you use any technology? Like, do you use um, any HRV? Do you use any virtual reality or anything like that in your workshops to help um, bring these kind of things to life and trigger, you know, emotional responses and bringing your strategies and things like that in workshops? How do they kind of look and unfold? Absolutely not. I deliberately remove technology from the room. Um, because you can't learn how to manage technology with technology. It's it's a bit like it's a bit like you want to learn to run a marathon, but you've got the, your KT twenty six is on, and you and you're always training in your KT twenty six. You've got to you just got to strip down, get back to basics, uh, conceptually understand what we're trying to achieve here. So for me, it's human to human connection. Brilliant. Um, when you look at the way uh, hormones and neuro, neurochemicals work, particularly the likes of oxytocin, is it's people working together to solve complex problems. Um, that that's yeah, it, that's why it exists. So back in the day with the village, and you went hunting, and you're going to go take on a saber toothed tiger, you you were forced through neurochemistry to bond together because your lives depended on it. Now our lives don't depend on anything. So we don't we don't do hard things together that often, um, which is why we don't feel connected and engaged, right? So, so, so I deliberately create an environment where people are challenged, they are tested together, to enable them to see what that feels like, mm. and to enjoy debriefing it, to enjoy going through a exercise where you probably got a sixty to seventy percent result that was good, and then we learn from the other thirty percent, and we do it again, and we get a ninety eight percent win. Uh, that to me is 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 what I think is important. Is technology important? M maybe you know. I, I I got into the whole metaverse. Every time something happens, I play with it. I got into the metaverse. Got a VR kit. I got it, and I'm like, it's still not as good as being in the room together. I got you know Chat GPT started using it to write my blogs. 
it's still not mm. as, as good as if I write my blog or the team writes it. It's all about speed, right? And speed is important, you know, because you have to be faster than the competition. So you still need speed. But speed in all sorts of different directions just creates a, a lot of noise and a lot of confusion. Speed needs to be focused. You need, you need speed and direction. That is what being a fighter pilot's about. You go very quickly that way. Um, and to go very quickly that way, that's why you need the story. That's why you need an objective. And that's why everything comes back to mm. where am I going? What is my intention? Why am I not there yet? What am I going to do about it? Um, so that's that to me is is um, technology has a time and a place. Technology is an enabler, but it also uses the wrong part of the mm, brain. It's a distractor as well. Uh, technology and, and there's well, look, there's you know I was reading a study the other day where they did an fMR uh, uh, a um a, a a kid in his late twenties had a brain injury like a, a recurring a brain injury from 10 years ago. And they, so he had to constantly get fMRIs to just to see how his brain was going. And what they discovered from the fMRI before COVID to the fMRI after COVID was his cerebellum, the, the smart part of the brain had shrunk up nearly 30%. Oh, wow. And the rest of the brain had grown uh, as, as a result of the consumptions of so much information and and that's what knowledge knowledge is important information is just distraction mm. and it's, it's very important that we differentiate between the two and knowledge is wisdom there we go how's that <laughs> bringing the whole conversation back? applied knowledge mate in wrap up uh you've you've already done this several times but i'd be interested just to know for uh, one or two things so the the philosophies around unbeatable you is that uh, to live an unbeatable life doesn't mean that we're immune to life's challenges and life's adversities. In actual fact, we're guaranteed to experience them because we are human and to endorse, uh, to embody in unbeatable practices allows us to navigate those challenges, whether it's the small daily ones or the big life adversities and not be beaten by them. So what would you say to the listeners? What are one or two key things that you would say to the listeners that they could look at implementing into their lives uh, now to help them kind of create and live their own unbeatable lives? The story is something that makes you feel good. So, so the story has to have uh, a feeling to it. It's not logic, right? So, so whatever you want has to feel worthy. It has to feel like it's worth the effort. Uh, and that, that's the thing that pulls you out of the muck every day, right? Uh, and so that's what I call the, the, the feel, the feeling side. It's not there to make you emotional. You shouldn't burst into tears or break out with joy about this destination. It just has to feel good. It has to be like a, like a rhythm, like a low hum of goodness. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the start of it. And, and uh, this, if you're in a career stream and, and you might have to be in a job for 30 years with the same company to get to the point where you get the financial independence that you want, that's fine. Like that, that serves a, it might not be the purpose, but it serves the purpose, right? So, so the purpose is the, is, is what, what feels like expending the effort. Then you've got to think about it every day. Think about what am I going to do to get there? And the thinking part of a day is getting replaced with the doing part, just consuming way too much information right or just being completely reactive and doing what you think is right not what is necessarily right so when it comes to thinking think about three things that you can do today so create the the mini story what what, what are the three things i do today that are going to inch me forward right then we do do them do the three things in fact, don't do one of the three things. Just do one of them, right? And and spend that time in the morning writing them on a piece of paper. Don't don't put it on a phone. Don't don't consume information first thing in the morning. I do. I do it, and it's not good. But I I, I uh, my ADHD uh, kryptonite is having the phone next to my bed. So so I I need to take my own medicine here. And not the days I don't do it, I'm much more productive and much happier than the days I'm on my damn phone. So, so get those three things written down. And what you'll find is you write down three things you want to get done today, you'll get them done in the first hour. 
and then create another three things and another three things. Uh, and every one of those three things, that gives you your daily debrief. So if you're not getting them done, so one of the three things that might be, okay, one of the things I want to do today is write my blog, right? I want to write a blog today and it's going to be a blog on, uh, I don't know, let's say it's a blog on effective communication uh, in uh, mining or oil and gas, how to effectively communicate on the deck of an oil rig, right? That's, so so I need, that's, that's what I need to do, one of my three things. To do that, I've got to do my research. So I want to find four articles and I want to find one medical journal, right? And I want to do that before lunchtime. Go. Ring, ring. Oh, phone's ringing. No, no, it's got nothing to do with my blogs. Ring, ring. Oh, oh, oh look, there's emails coming in. Oh, there's the thing I I need was waiting to get back yesterday afternoon that I had to do, but they've only given it to me this morning. No, no, it's not one of my mm. three things. It's not, none of that is my three things. So nothing else gets looked at until I finish the three things, okay? If I don't finish the three things, then I incorporate a loop, a thought loop. So, so to me, we live in this world of thought loops, feelings, thoughts, and actions connected by reflection. So, so when, I, when I'm sitting there and I say, I didn't get my three things today, I say, what was my intention? Write a blog. What happened? I got my research done, couldn't find a medical journal. Uh, so I didn't get it done. Why? Why didn't you get it done? Well, because I got distracted. And, and, and what we've discovered at Afterburner over the last 25 years is there's seven things that happen in life that create 80% of the shortfalls of performance. The same things over and over and over again, right? And this is from a, a set of 30 root causes. It's the same six or seven every time. Uh, but that's another point. Like <laughs> oh, you've left us hanging there. Yeah, yeah. Website, find out more about that. Uh, uh, and, and through those micro debriefs, that's where you, that's where you start to, um, uh, that's where you say to yourself, right, my action is to finish it in the next hour. I want to finish it before the end of the day. And I'm just going to commit to it. I'm going to turn everything off and get it, get it done. So, so then, so, so that, that three, and that's again, goes back to fighter pilot thinking. We only ever have three objectives in a mission. But I can have three today, three this week, three this month, three this quarter, three this year, right? And, and it's just the size of the three changes, but they should all be linked up. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't ever do any, like in the perfect deep performing world, in your day, there shouldn't be any activity that doesn't equal the achievement of your story. Mm. That, that's perfect deep performance, right? Uh, that's impossible. So it's impossible because of all the distractions and other demands, like because you're also a character in other people's book, right? So, so you've got roles to play elsewhere. What we forget when we write our own story is to create time and space to be characters in other people's books as well. And therefore, when we get pulled into those stories, we get frustrated and we're like, hey, this is not my story. Uh, well, it, it, it will be because if you're not a character in your kid's book or your wife's book or your husband's book, Pretty soon they're going to rip a chapter out of your book, uh, so so that's that's important as well. Uh, and the science behind th number three is the smallest pattern that the brain can recognize, and the brain prefers patterns over data, uh, and that's 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 why you know, that's how day traders work. That's how you know most most people don't look at the detail; they look at the pattern. So if you're trying to do a to-do list of 10 or 20 things, you don't remember them, you don't do them, you just keep adding to them. Remember, we, we don't know the difference between now and later. So, so what happens most of the time, people will think, they'll, they'll do the thinking part and they'll go, here's my to-do list in the morning. Then they'll do, and when you're doing, your, your thinking brain switches off and you do the first one or two things on your to-do list. It starts to become overwhelming. You procrastinate because that's what you do. If, if it's too hard to do, you don't do it. Uh, and then you go and start to be busy. You start to do stuff that doesn't, oh, I think I might need to update my windows or maybe I need to clean up the folders on my mm. computer. You just start to do stuff that, that, that well, here's, here's a really interesting study, right? If you've got time for this, this is, this is a really interesting study. Um, there was a study done where they put a whole bunch of people into a white room, right? And with a white chair. And they had to sit with their own thoughts for, 15 minutes. There was different time. Let's just call it 15 minutes. There were different kind of studies, but the gist of it was stuck in a white room, reflect on your own thoughts and rank what you thought that was like. Did you enjoy it? 
And most people didn't enjoy it, right? So they said, let's put everyone, let's do it again, but we're going to do it at home. So the same uh, people that were involved in the study went and sat at home and they had to sit at home for 15 minutes. Right? And they had to say, how did you go? Did you enjoy sitting at home by yourself for 15 minutes? And they're expecting the result to be better, but it was exactly the same. And in fact, at home, half the people admitted to cheating and turning on the TV. 15 minutes. So then they said, right, let's try one more. We're going to do one more thing. We're going to do one more thing here. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to, going to get a nice big car battery, stick some electrodes on it, and we're going to stick it to people's ankles. And, and what is going to happen is if they hit a button, they're going to get a really severe electric shock. And what we're going to do is we're going to wire them up back in the white room and we're going to put them in there for 15 minutes, wire it up, and, and, the, and they are told that if they touch that button, they're going to get a severe electric shock. And what do you think happened? 65% of men would rather have an electric shock than sit with their own thoughts for 15 You're minutes. You're kidding me. And 25% of women. It, it's, this com, it's this compulsion. And again, it's, it doesn't prove anything, but, but it just it's another indicator of, of our bias to just doing mm. things, even if it's the wrong thing, is, is more powerful than sitting back and thinking about before we do it. Mm. So that's that's what we're fighting here. Performance is between the ears, behind the eyes. There is nothing in the performance space that doesn't begin and end in the mind. The mind drives the neuro, it drives the nervous system. The nervous system drives your muscles. It uh, it drives your thoughts, your heartbeat, all your reg, all the regulators within your body. So the more the more we try and influence that. In, in the in, in the right way, the better we become. The reason I've got that plasma ball is to as I use do it as use a little experiment, right? A plasma ball is just unbridled electricity in a in a in a ball, yeah. Uh, and we've seen them at museums. We've we've played with them before, and we know that when we put a finger on it, that the electricity grounds mm. out through our body through our finger, yeah, and we get that strong beam. But if you sit back and, and play with a play with a plasma ball, what you'll see is if you put two fingers on there, you dilute the energy to both fingers and it and the energy bounces back and forward. You put three, you put four, you put five. And what you start to see is this diluted electricity flip-flopping between the five fingers. Now, if that's a brain, five fingers equals five mm. things on your to-do list. It equals five goals, five objectives. And every time you try and do five things at once, you dilute the power of your brain. You put one finger, one objective, one thing at a time. Your brain is just a big ball of electricity. You get all of that electricity aligning all of the cells in your brain to drive the outcome, to get the clarity of thought, to get the energy and the right muscles. That is the power of deep performance, the ability to do the right thing at the right time to power you towards your destination. So powerful, so powerful. That, I think that's a really good point to end on. And uh, coming from a man with ADHD who's managed to be able to funnel that focus and have only one finger on there uh, most of the time by the sounds of it and the direction that you're on is, is super inspiring. Boo, we could actually uh, talk all day and... <laughs> There's no plasma ball big enough, mate, to do my, to do my neural energy. <laughs> We're definitely going to have to get you on sometime in the future after you've spent a bit of time in the States and uh, evolved even more. I'd be super intrigued to, to touch base again. But in the meantime, where is the best place for people to follow your journey? I know it's not Instagram because that's where I sent you a personalized video and uh, you didn't come across that. I had to go find a connection to, to send that through to you. So for pe anywhere online, uh, people to read your blogs no, that you I've, mentioned uh, and uh, connect with you where's the best place to find you online mate i've outsourced i have to do that instagram i'm gonna have to get someone to do it for me i'm, I'm not i'm not of the social media generation and it's just a distraction so for me uh, callmeboo.com is how you find me uh, or if you're looking for organizational or you or you just you just need something to hang your hat on you just need something to break the cycle you need some inspiration and you need a direction afterburner.com uh, and that's where I have a team of really capable, super impressive fighter pilots that can come in, work with you, work with your team uh, and help you unlock some of this potential. 
Brilliant. Super powerful. Boo, you're a legend. I want to acknowledge you for your passion and your purpose to help people tap into their best lives. And you're doing it from a, a fun and empowering place. Keep shining your impactful and abundant light to the world, my man. Thanks, Robbo. Appreciate the opportunity to have this wonderful conversation with you today, mate. Thank you. Right back at you. And all the best in the States. Thanks again, legend. There you go. Another empowering episode. And thanks again for tuning in. Make sure you check out the show notes for any extra links or information that we spoke about in this episode. Don't forget you can now catch the Unbeatable You podcast on the YouTube channel, Brett Robbo Coach. If you want info and inspiration straight into your inbox on how to live an unbeatable life, you can sign up to receive weekly insights and actionable steps for optimal performance and thriving in every aspect of your life, plus first release offers on Unbeatable You courses and live events. Don't worry, there's no spam, just short, punchy, value-giving emails straight to you. Simply go to brettrobbo.com forward slash community. If you find value in this podcast, don't forget to share it around with your mates and subscribe, rate, and review. It really supports the podcast mission massively. If you want to reach out to me personally, you can connect with me at at Brett Robbo Coach on social media, and that's where you can let me know who you want to hear on the show. Keep thriving, legends, and as always, remember, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? This is your opportunity to live your unbeatable life.